No, skepticism is awesome. It's, there you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. I, this talk is called Do Be a Dick, but she keeps telling me, but it's not really about that. So why did you tell me? Well, it's that? partially about that. It's about emotions in general as okay. well. Oh, okay. so, it's broader than just dicks. It is. <laughs> <laughs> what broader dicks? <laughs> oh, good. My mother will be so proud. <laughs> I give you... Ashley Effin Miller. Well, thank you for that <laughs> sterling introduction. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, as he said, I'm Ashley. Um, I'm currently getting my PhD in mass communications, but my background is in film and television. And so what I want to talk about is emotions, and my background in film is helpful because Films work because they speak not only in images, but also in emotions. When you think about movies that you saw a long time ago, you often won't remember the plot or the character names. You'll often remember the actors. But what really sticks with you is the moments of emotional impact in the film. The shower scene in Schindler's List, the sisters being reunited in The Color Purple, um, the death of Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic. These are the things that really stick with you. And that's one of the main reasons we're really drawn into movies. They use a lot of tricks to get you involved. They use music and the lighting. They use editing and writing. Um, and they use actors that are already famous and that you're already emotionally attached to. And one of their best tricks is the close-up. If you think about how close you are to someone who's in a close-up, the only people in your life you ever see that close are either your family or your lovers. That's it. You don't see people that close. So it creates this false intimacy. This isn't really what my talk is necessarily about. It's sort of a preamble to set you up to understand how important emotions are to getting you involved in an argument. Emotions are what gets you involved in a film, in fiction, but they're also what really sells an argument to you. Uh, last year at TAM, The Amazing Meeting, um, Phil Plate gave a speech that was partially about how to argue and it gained the reputation of being the don't be a dick speech, uh, which is great, it's very catchy. Uh, I took it kind of personally because I'm a smart ass, so you know, it felt like it was aimed at me, which it really wasn't at all. And he has a lot of good points within the speech, one of which is that when skeptics argue, they don't engage with emotions intentionally they often just happen to hit emotions by accident when they're going through what they're talking about. And they should be a lot more intentional with what they're doing. So if you're being a dick and you don't realize you're being a dick, that's a problem. If you're being a dick and you know you're being a dick and you're doing it for a reason, it's not a problem. But intentionality is really important. Um, being a dick can work. It can work sometimes. Um, so the two things I'm covering today are why being a dick can work and the broader point of emotions are important in arguments. Um, they're interrelated. Uh, insults are almost necessarily emotional. Um, they just tend to get you emotionally involved and not always in a negative way. Um, it brings about different emotional responses in the person who is insulting the person who is being insulted, and the audience that is witnessing the insulting. Uh, emotions are not really easy to scientifically understand. They're not rational, um, but they are essential to making a good argument. Um, I'm going to refer to <laughs> Aristotle. <laughs> yes, I don't really like PowerPoint, so it's just jokes. Um, <laughs> Um, so Aristotle has a approach to rhetoric uh, that involves three parts, pathos, ethos, and logos, which is logic, ethics, and 
emotions. Basically, it's, is your argument logical? Does it make sense? Are you someone I trust to give me an argument? And do I emotionally connect with your argument? On the first count, I think skeptics have it covered. We are logical. We are good at logic. And people trust us to be logical. We struggle a little more with ethos, not because we're unethical, but because at times we're not perceived as ethical by other people. This is especially true of people making atheistic arguments from a skeptic point of view. Um, and so that is a struggle that I think we are slowly making headway on. I think people are perceiving us as more ethical than they used to. Um, and it's something we should be working on. And the last one, of course, is pathos, which is the emotional side of the argument. Um, we, we see sort of the interrelation between ethos and pathos in ad hominem attacks. Um, ad hominem just being an attack on someone's credibility that doesn't have anything to do with their argument. They're just talking about the person's character. And for the most part, we perceive these things as maybe a little immoral and underhanded to ad hominem attack somebody. But emotionally, it's a very effective tool and at times is appropriate. Um, for example, when you point out that Ted Haggard hates gay people, but that he also has gay sex, um, his argument that gay people are bad isn't necessarily impacted by the fact that he has gay sex. It, it's, not, it's still an ad hominem attack to point it out. But, Hypocrisy is something that people really care about and want to know. And of course, his argument is illogical at best, um, biblical at worst. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's the emotionally correct way to approach the argument, but not necessarily the logical way. Uh, if you look at the progress of the skeptic movement and the atheist movement lately, you see that we have been focusing on things that are a little bit outside the traditional scope. We've been moving into charity, we've been moving into reaching out to people, and we've been moving more into media spotlight. Um, one of the great things about charity is that it helps raise our ethos, it, it raises our image, and people perceive us as better people because we're helping others. As they say in Avenue Q, when you help others, you can't help helping yourself. Uh, but there's also been a push in the movement from people like Greta Christina and Jamila Bay and Debbie Goddard, who may or may not be in the room, um, to focus on issues that are important to other people. We don't necessarily have credibility with a lot of other people who are outside the skeptic movement. If we want to reach out to them, we need to be addressing issues that are important to them. UFOs are interesting to some people, but not necessarily on a daily basis in a lot of people's lives. So talking about things like abstinence-only education and how scientifically it doesn't work um, is a good thing. It's, a, it's a, something that we can cover from a skeptical point of view that is helpful to us on a purely selfish basis we should be doing this because it helps our image even if we don't care that much about the issues. I personally think we should care a lot about these issues but even if you don't from a selfish point of view there's a lot of reasons to really broaden the umbrella. Um, so we get to pathos. Obviously the three things are interrelated and you can't have one without the others. Um, they're dependent on each other and if you focus strictly on logic you're still impacting the other two, but you're not doing it intentionally. If you're making a strictly logical argument without acknowledging everything else, it doesn't work. You're still having an impact on your image and still having an impact on the emotions of people. You're just not doing it with intent. Um, people aren't rational. And to ignore that is irrational. Embracing emotions is very important because people have gut reactions before they have a logical understanding. And if you don't acknowledge that, you're undermining your argument from the beginning. Um, if you look at the lawsuits that we've been fighting, separation of church and state issues, we have a lot of trouble with them, which is why the SCA is currently moving away from cases that are establishment clause cases because they're philosophical arguments. 
and people don't really care that much about philosophical arguments. And what they're pursuing now are equal rights cases because people care about when people are mistreated. That's an easier sell because people immediately latch on to the idea of someone being mistreated. Using emotion doesn't mean lying. You can use emotion very honestly. It just means you have to take into account that people are going to respond to you emotionally. Um, and the thing is, our enemies, the people who are fighting logic, are people who are masters of emotion. People who are religious are geniuses at manipulating emotion. We're already at a disadvantage. We need to be playing the same game that they are because we're going to lose. Uh, with facts, you have what someone should care about, but with emotion, you have why should they care? Why should they get involved? Um, one of the greatest dicks of all time was a man named Cicero, who is basically the father of rhetoric and interestingly, also one of the fathers of humanism, which is sort of a, an interesting thing to be, both a humanist and a dick. Um, you'd think that that's difficult, but no, it just seems to go right hand in hand with him. Um, he had a very Machiavellian approach to emotion, which was that he had to use it to get people on his side. Although he came before Machiavelli, so maybe Machiavelli is Ciceronian? <laughs> um, uh, he, his life was dedicated to politics and public service, uh, but one of the things he's most well known for is a series of speeches against Mark Antony. He recognized an important distinction that we should recognize as well. When you're making an argument in public, you're not just arguing with one person. You're arguing with one person and putting on a display for everybody else in the room. Obviously, I am giving a display to everyone in the room. That's easy to get. But if I insult someone in the front row, I'm now making you the audience to the insult. And you have a much different perspective than whoever I'm insulting. It's perfectly possible to insult someone and engage the audience in a very different way. It's true regardless of the medium. If you're watching television, you're watching Jon Stewart or Bill O'Reilly, they're obviously engaging in front of an audience, but then they're also being broadcast in front of a whole other audience. So you've got a series of different kinds of people that are being engaged. This is true in any public forum. This is true online. A YouTube debate, a Facebook argument, the comments on a blog. When I post a comment on a blog with someone I disagree with, I almost don't even care if the person who wrote the blog even reads my message. I care that all the other people who read the blog see a different point of view. And so even if I did care what the person who wrote the blog thought, I know that I'm not just engaging them. And I think most of us intuitively understand that, right? We get that when we write a blog or a response to a blog, it's public, it's not just an argument with one person, that's email. Um, so the Mark Antony speeches are a perfect example of this. Mark Antony was in the presence of many of the speeches, but they weren't really aimed at him. And he just tore Antony apart, talked about how he liked to whore around and take it up the butt and stuff like that, like stuff that was really relevant to politics at all. Um, but he wasn't doing it because he cared what Mark Antony thought. Mark Antony was going to hate him regardless and ended up killing him later. Um, <laughs> that is one of the drawbacks of being a dick, just to throw that out there. <laughs> <What's> the <biggest? laughs> one of the biggest, yes. Um, fortunately, people aren't murdered as often for being a dick as they were, you know, under Caesar. Occasionally. You know. But so Cicero, he understood that what he was doing was trying to consolidate power for himself. He was trying to consolidate people's point of view. He was trying to get people on his side and interested and invested in his side. And so it was a way to speak truth to power, but it wasn't ever going to change the power. It was a way to weaken the support of that power. Um, Another thing that insults are really good at 
is entertaining people. <laughs> people love insults on television. They find them hilarious. They like yo mama jokes for some reason. They just enjoy insults. And people who insult aren't just um, being mean. They're also showing that they're clever, that they're intellectually superior. Um, someone who insults someone else isn't necessarily a bad guy. Maybe a little insensitive, but not a bad person. Uh, when House calls someone an idiot, we love it. We think he's great. And part of it is because he's showing confidence in himself. He knows that he's right. And we like people who are confident. We like people who know they're right. Unless we disagree with them. We really, we are drawn to that. You know, and so he's not afraid to speak the truth. He's not afraid to put it in the form of a put down. He's not afraid to, you know, cut someone down a few pegs. For example, to someone's insistent insistence on humility, he says, humility is an important quality, especially if you're wrong a lot. <laughs> of course, when you're right, humility doesn't help anybody, does it? You know, and, and, and that's true. It's mean to the person who said it, but it's, it's true and it makes you think and engage with him. And the entertainment purpose really is important, and I don't want to just make it a side note. Entertainment is one of the things that draws people into movements. Um, if you think about the rise in attention towards the atheist movement and the rise in attendance towards skeptical conventions, this has a lot to do with the fact that atheists have been a lot more entertaining in the last 10 years than they were in the 10 years before that. They've been funny. They've been mean. They've been interesting. And you know, you don't have to be right to get on television. It doesn't have anything to do with that. You can be very wrong. You just have to be entertaining. Viewers equal dollars and people watch what's entertaining. And coverage means awareness and awareness means that people can't pretend we don't exist anymore. And we have to thank for that a lot of dicks. We have Richard Dawkins saying some horrible things in a very charming British sort of way. We have Christopher Hitchens saying even better horrible things that just make me giggle and smile and be happy, which is probably wrong. Um, <laughs> it's weird, isn't it, that Christopher Hitchens is so attractive despite the fact that he's not at all attractive? Uh, you, we've got the American atheist the billboards, all the billboards, the mean ones that get people on Fox News. They get Silverman on Fox News so that he can look at Bill O'Reilly like he's insane. <laughs> because tides go in, tides go out, never a miscommunication. You can't explain it. It's magic. I mean, come on. All hail Goddess Luna. Um, <laughs> So there's a fantastic nerdy book on the subject called Toward a Rhetoric of Insult by a guy named Thomas Conley, which I discovered at like three in the morning while I was surfing Amazon, like insults, let, there's gotta be something about this, right? And he really analyzes the cultural importance and how interwoven insults are in culture. And one of the most interesting observations he makes is that for an insult to work, Everybody witnessing the insult has to have the same world view and the same moral sort of groundwork. Um, basically, someone insulting someone else is claiming moral superiority in some way or another. And for that to work, everyone else has to think that the morals he's claiming are good morals. Um, for example, I'm just doing this because it's like one of my favorite insults of all time. H.L. Minkin talking about President Warren G. Harding. He writes the worst English that I have ever encountered. It reminds me of a string of wet sponges. It reminds me of tattered washing on the line. It reminds me of stale bean soup of college yales, of dogs barking idiotically through endless nights. It is so bad that a sort of grandeur creeps into it. It drags itself out of the dark abyss of pish and crawls insanely up to the topmost pinnacle of Bosch. It is rumble and bumble. It is flap and doodle. It is balder and dash. <laughs> so, what he's appealing to is this idea that we all think that bad English 
is bad. We all think that dogs barking in the middle of the night is horrifyingly awful. Even the person being insulted will agree that these things are all bad. It's just that he also has to disagree with him being those things. Um, Insults can also work to bring people closer together or to motivate people. If you think about drill sergeants or coaches, a lot of times they use insults to get the best out of people. It's the way they draw people into what they're doing. Sororities and fraternities use the same sort of thing to make people feel a part of the culture. So in this case, an insult is actually creating a community and drawing the insulter and the insultee closer together. So th there's a lot of ways that insults are used that are not about separating people but about bringing them together. Um, to quote Thomas Conley directly, one side of insult calls for shared values and beliefs. It rests on a kind of intimacy between the insulter and the one being insulted and can be a way of reinforcing social bonds not just asserting alienation. Finally, insults can be a powerful mode of truth-telling. There is, perhaps, a huge gap between a troll on a website and Christopher Hitchens. But I suspect that many Christians would accuse Hitchens of being a troll. The spectrum of dicks doesn't mean that you either have to be Hitchens or a troll. It doesn't mean you have to be Hitchens or you're not allowed to be a dick at all. It means that context matters and you should be aware of what you're trying to accomplish. You may not accomplish it, but at least know what you're trying to do. This is the art of rhetoric in general, but I think that what the don't be a dick side misses is that there is a place for insult and dickishness within the art of rhetoric. So we're back to the broader point, which is emotions. Let's, let's use them. Let's, let's do it. Come on. Um, Woo! Yeah! Um, people respond to personal stories and what I'm going to use now is um, I'm going to talk about Prop 8 which was a campaign in California to get rid of gay marriage. Um, the gay movement and the atheist and skeptic movements have a lot in common. Like gay people, atheists and skeptics can be invisible in their daily lives. They can be in the closet unintentionally or intentionally um, and there's a lot of false stereotypes out there, a lot of false assumptions that people make about gay people and about atheists and about skeptics. Um, but we know what those are. The emotional groundwork is laid. It's not like we don't realize this. It's not like we're walking into a room blind. We know the groundwork is already there. For those who don't follow gay rights issues, um, I'll give you a brief background on Prop 8. In 2000, there was a ballot initiative for a, for a law called Proposition 22, which banned gay marriage. Now, a law is not as powerful as a constitutional amendment. So this law was more vulnerable to change than a constitutional amendment would be. It easily won the popular vote, but in 2004, San Francisco started issuing marriage licenses anyway to same-sex couples. So this led to a series of lawsuits, and in 2008, the Supreme Court in California overturned Proposition 22, meaning that gay marriage was legal in California. They started doing, performing gay marriages in June of 2008, and November of 2008, on the ballot was a constitutional amendment that was the exact same wording as Prop 22, banning same-sex marriage. The interesting thing about California is unlike, you know, if you're not big on civics, unlike the United States as a whole, it only takes a simple majority to update the Constitution, not a two-thirds majority. This means that it's more vulnerable to insanity. Um, there are some crazy things in the California Constitution, because 50% of the people can be very special sometimes. Um, that's just true. So it was the most expensive campaign in California history, and it was second in 2008 only to the presidential election. That's how much money was involved in this fight. Between June and November, 18,000 couples were married in California. 
create, making California the only place where there are married gay couples but people can't get married anymore. There's 18,000 gay couples that are married but you're not allowed to get gay married because it's wrong except for that once when it wasn't. Um, it's a little confusing here. Oh, the, here's the accurate depictions of gays and atheists. Uh, we're baby eaters. <laughs> um, and I just love the unicorn picture. That's like my favorite thing I've ever found on the internet. It's just fantastic. It w looks appropriate for Dragon Con, now that I think about it. Uh, uh, it's a brony, right? That's the term. So this gets a little confusing, because yes in this case means no to gay marriage, and no in this ca case means yes for gay marriage. So no on eight are, in my opinion, the good guys. They're the ones fighting for same-sex marriage. Yes on eight are the bad guys. They're the ones who are like, gay people are evil and are going to kill our kids or something. So I'll leave that up for a second. The no on eight campaign was horrible. It just failed on so many levels. There was a lot of assumption at the beginning that there was no way Californians would vote to hurt gay people because it's California and everybody's so laid back and awesome because people forget that San Francisco and Los Angeles are only part of California. Um, it wasn't because they didn't have the resources. They were outspending the Yes on 8 campaign 2 to 1 and 4 to 1 in the last week and the last day of the campaign. They had more money. It should have been a cakewalk. But instead, the Yes on 8 people won because they had emotional capital in the game and the No on 8 people didn't. They got out there emotionally first they got out emotionally better, and No on 8 was completely blindsided by it, as though they didn't realize that these arguments that had been used for 20 years were going to show up again. It was like they were just so stupid that they couldn't realize that people were going to use the same tactics that they always had. I don't know what they were expecting. Um, so. I have a couple of the ads here to illustrate the difference between emotionally engaging someone and, you know, not. Um, this is their, the biggest ad that No on 8 put out. It was called Conversation, and it's a, two women looking at photos saying that taking away fundamental rights is wrong without, you know, explaining what the fundamental rights really are or why they're fundamental. Um, it was so ineffective it got pulled early. So I'm gonna play that for you now. Here's Bob at the barbecue. <laughs> Look at his sunburn. <laughs> and here's our niece Maria and her partner Julie at their wedding. Listen, honestly, I just don't know how I feel about this same-sex marriage thing. No, it's okay. And I really think it's fine if you don't know how you feel, but are you willing to eliminate rights and have our laws treat people differently? No. Don't eliminate marriage for anyone. Vote no on Prop 8. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that like the best commercial you've ever seen? Yeah, it's um, one, why have an ad for your side that has someone who's against your side but not a bad person? That's like, that's like not a good idea, right? We get that. Two, why, why not talk about what the issue actually is instead of sort of dancing around it? Because we don't want to say gay on TV because gay is bad, even though we're pro-gay. So it was so boring it got pulled early. It was so awful it got pulled early. Like, millions of dollars went into that. So, <clears throat> and there's no, there's no emotional appeal at all. It's, it's all a philosophical idea that, you know, taking away rights is wrong, even though I'm not making an argument as to what those rights really are or should be or why. And this is the best ad that the Yes on Aiders put out. It's a child coming home from school saying that she learned how a prince could marry another prince and that she could marry a princess. Isn't that sweet? Mom, guess what I learned in school today? What, sweetie? I learned how a prince married a prince, and I can marry a princess. Think it can happen? It's already happened. 
When Massachusetts legalized gay marriage, schools began teaching second graders that boys can marry boys. It stopped for some reason. Well, it doesn't matter. That's the main thrust of it, anyway. <laughs> so this played on the subtle message that gay marriage was going to pervert childhood in some way. Uh, it's all they had to do was just imply what and, and and fairy tales, uh, which is worse, really. And he's a professor. He is a professor at a law school. Oh. Although it doesn't actually say that he's a lawyer. <laughs> just saying, he could be anything. He could just be like some guy. Jesus. English professor. English professor at the school of law. Totally possible. The janitor. The professor. Jan and maybe his name is just professor. <laughs> it's possible, you know. Don't want, don't want to make any assumptions here. Um, this is it's similar to the bias against atheists and skeptics. You just have to hint at it, and it's already they've made the argument. But that just means we have to know that it's coming. Um, what's really shocking about this ad is that it pulled the support of 500,000 parents who had been in favor of gay marriage. They switched their vote. Half a million people switched their vote after seeing this ad. That's incredible. We lost by 504,000 votes. If this ad hadn't come out and hadn't been so effective, we would have won. So effective advertising does have an impact. A major one in this case. Two weeks later, we finally gave a rebuttal. Two weeks it took for us to address this commercial that was so effective. And it did, it did make a difference, but it was so close to the actual election that it didn't have time to make much of an impact. I'm gonna play this one for you, and then that, that will be all of the ads you have to watch. Have you seen the TV ads for Prop 8? They're absolutely not true, says California's superintendent of public schools. Prop 8 has nothing to do with schools or kids. Our schools aren't required to teach anything about marriage. And using kids to lie about that is shameful. That's why... Oh, well. The system is down. Um, but, you know, he's, he's shaming the other side, which is effective because shame on them for using children. And they had children in ads that hadn't been given permission to be in the ads, and parents sued the campaign for using children without permission. There's a lot of horrible things going on behind the scenes um, on the yes on eight side, which all has come out since through the uh, lawsuit that's currently going on. Um, they won, right, it doesn't matter how they got there means to the end. All right, so back to wherever I was. There we go. All right, so this is an illegible graph because I feel like that's necessary for people to believe I have credibility. Um, <laughs> if you look at princes, you'll see that the way that things have sort of switched and moved apart. And then this is the mothers. And princes comes out, and about a week of penetration of princes, and they flop, they flop sides. Um, and if you look down here, it starts on the 6th of October. That's when princes starts airing. On the 24th of or excuse me, the 22nd of October, that's when we finally got the ad that was a rebuttal out. And you can see it sort of had an impact, but not for very long. All right, so what this means for skepticism is this. If you want to promote an idea, you need to be making the emotional grab. So, which is a more effective argument? Homeopathy, it's minuscule amounts of questionably useful substances diluted beyond a trace, which is true. Or homeopathy kills. It's not medicine, it's fraud. We get that, that makes sense. We've got the super clever uh, 10 to the 23rd homeopathy, there's nothing in it, things, which is great if you're a chemistry major. <laughs> I, 
I get it. It's awesome. Avogadro. Yes. But it doesn't draw people in. It doesn't get you emotionally involved unless you already know what 10 to the 23rd means. <laughs> the Tim Minchin caption? Yes. Um, Tim Minchin? Tim Minchin is a comedian from Australia and then London who this particular quote is taken from a nine minute beat poem called Storm, which is an argu is basically him having an argument with a hippie chick about things like homeopathy and physics and um, it's really brilliant. You should find it if you haven't seen it. He's the much version much better version of Russell Brand. <laughs> He's the much better version of Russell Brand. Yeah, well, there, I, I don't think that that's even true because he's so much better that Russell Brand isn't even in the same universe. <laughs> Although Russell Brand is cute. They look almost the same. They do look very similar except for Tim Minchin is a ginger and Russell Brand isn't. So, by the way, only a ginger can call another ginger ginger. And that'll be funny to the three of you who know who Tim Minchin is. Yeah, yes, I see you. Yeah. What? They don't know which one it is. They won't know until they hear it. So basically it's a Reddit thing, you wouldn't understand it. Yes, it's a Reddit thing, you wouldn't understand it. Not that I'm on Reddit, so... A red thing? Oh yes, a red thing, I get that. No. No. Everybody can get ginger jokes. They just can't use the word. Um, so yes, homeopathy violates all the known laws of physics. We get that. Nobody cares. Why should I care that, you know, physics, whatever. It doesn't impact my daily life. I mean, it does, but not in a way that I think about. Um, so when we protest people saying under God in the, cons you know, in the Pledge of Allegiance, it feels really petty to people because they don't get why it matters. But when we point out to someone refusing to say it and getting bullied, people emotionally get involved. So it, it, it's a very slight difference in how you approach it. But if you say, hey, this kid's not saying it because he doesn't believe in God and we are punishing him for his beliefs. People emotionally connect with that and get behind it. And when you point to harm, especially to children, as we saw in the Prop 8 ads, it works. Um, think about the It Gets Better campaign. People don't necessarily care that much about gay teenagers, but when you point out how much harm happens to them because they're gay and because of the prejudice that exists and because of adult behavior, people sort of get on board. They get it and they want to make it better. Um, so, for example, we could talk about vaccines and how people are dying because Andrew Wakefield is a jackass. Um, how Ginny McCarthy and Christian scientists and Scientologists and Jehovah's Witnesses all deny life-saving treatments to children. That gets people on board. Let's do that. Let's talk about things that get people on board. Psychics and faith healers. You, you don't talk about how it's physically impossible for them to do what they're doing. You talk about the people that they're hurting by doing what they're doing. I mean, most people look at Yuri Geller and are like, eh, whatever. But when you point out that there's someone who's giving him money because they think that it's real, that impacts people. That gets people involved. Um, and you can be a real dick about these people. You can be a total dick about Yuri Geller. That's fine. People like that. You can be a dick about Jenny McCarthy because they're harming people. So when you're a dick to them, that's just great. People love it. Um, Darren Brown, I don't, you might not know who Darren Brown is. He is also British. He uh, put out a television special about faith healers earlier this year. And the premise was that he trained somebody to be a faith healer who wasn't really a believer. Trained just this nobody, taught him all the tricks, and he went out and convinced people that he was real, that what he was doing was real. And so that's, that intellectually engages people as to what the tricks are. But the more important part of the series was talking about the people who were being hurt. The old women who, whose children were dying and who went to pray and who were being taken advantage of. A woman who had her, her child was killed and a psychic called her because she saw it in the newspaper and asked her to come to the show. And then picked her out of the audience and said, hey, did this just happen to your kid? 
And everyone was like, oh my god, I can't believe that you knew that. And the woman was like, she just used me. She just, she just asked me to come to this show and then used me. That's, people will emotionally get that that's horrible, that that's taking advantage of people. It, it works. I mean, it's horrible. All right, so Darren Brown exposed the tricks, right? But, which were the facts of the case, but he focused on emotion. You know, these people aren't tricksters. They're way, way worse than that. They're, they're not just taking some people's money. They're hurting people. They're killing people and blaming it on their lack of faith. We need more stuff like this. We need more reach out. We need more people showing the emotional side of these arguments. We need more people being funny. We need more people being entertaining. We need more outreach to charity. We need to be doing these emotional things. That's what we need to be doing and that we're not doing enough of. We're starting to engage, but this is where we need to be going. Basically, we've got the facts to win their minds, but let's not be afraid to use emotions to win their hearts as well. And I'll take questions if anyone has them. Hi there. Um, Hello. I was wondering how you think the the argument. Oh well, let's not get emotional. Oh well, let's not attack. Let's say Christianity or some religion or hippie bullshit or whatever. Um, you need to be considerate of other people's feelings. And if you make anybody sad or the least bit upset, then you're wrong it immediately. <laughs> Is kind of a political argument. It's sure. kind of yeah. trying to shut down um, debate and I don't want to say stifle free speech because you're not talking about necessarily government action or anything. Right. But that same sort of, of uh, behavior with the same intent and the same outcome. Well, I think that that's right in one sense and that <coughs> considerate, right, is the word which means to consider. We should consider other people's emotions, right? It doesn't mean that they're valid or that we have to respect them. So I can take into account your emotions without granting them any validity. I can take into account your emotions and then be a dick. However, that's not always the best approach. If I'm having a one-on-one -on -one argument with you, it's a very bad way to approach it because I'm trying to engage you. And usually the best way to approach stuff is peripherally, not straight head on. And so in a way, yes, the argument to not be a dick and the argument to be a dick are very similar in that they're saying emotions are important and when you're making an argument, know what you're doing with them. So yes, consider other people's feelings. I disagree with the conclusion that everyone should be treated with kid gloves. Yeah, I, Mr. Miller, uh, the guy, the American Atheist president, was here last night and gave an interesting talk. And he made the point, uh, you know, we talked about the Daily Show and whatever. He made the point, you know, he's not trying to convert theists. He's trying to organize all the atheists that he thinks there's a, you know, a substantial number out there, which is fine. And, I mean, I'm as hardcore as any of these guys, new atheists or whatever, in terms of, you know, not liking religion. But... You know, in daily life, I, you know, I need to probably work with this. I mean, if I'm working on political issues like, you know, global warming or gay marriage or whatever, uh, you know, I don't want to start out with the, at least the subtext that you're an idiot, you know, because you believe certain things. Well, who has the energy to do that? Well, uh, but, but, you know, <laughs> like, like in broader life. So, and, and like in, in, you know, gay marriage, I mean, maybe the model is New York. I don't know the details of that, but they actually got that through the legislature about Right, it was so. a, legislature, a legislative move, not a constitutional amendment move. It's slightly right, different. Right, but, but you know, they, they built the coalition, I, yeah. I presume including some people that don't particularly like gay marriage, but said, okay, it's time, as opposed to some other approaches, like, for example, it probably cost John Kerry the election in 2004 because these things were on the ballot in certain states and brought out the, uh, you know, the anti... But I anyway, disagree I guess with that conclusion, but yeah. Right, but my question, I guess, is, you know, how, how do you balance it out if you're, like, dealing, you know, with the, you know, the broader world? I mean, you know, you're not just dealing with skepticism or whatever. You're trying to get something done politically where you have to work with, with other people, you know, like liberal preachers or whatever. You have to think about it. I mean, 
and there's room for both. There's room for everybody. A movement works best when it doesn't try to silence part of the movement. It works best when PZ Myers is allowed to be PZ Myers and Daniel Loxton is allowed to be Daniel Loxton. And what they're doing is talking to other people and not trying to shut one another up. And a little bit of the problem with the don't be a dick conversation is there is that feeling that the people who don't want people to be dicks don't want the dicks to talk. Um, and I think that they're wrong. Um, and so do a lot of other dicks. Um, but <clears throat> to the other point, I don't think that you have to be one or the other all the time. Just because you are nice or not nice in some circumstances doesn't mean you can't be the other in another. PZ Myers, for example, is vitriolic on his website. He's cruel. He's heartless in a giddy sort of way. But in his classroom, he doesn't bring it up. He doesn't talk about it because it's not appropriate. And it's, you have to trust people to know what's appropriate and inappropriate, which involves a lot of trust because most people don't. But the more we ask people to engage with it intelligently, the more we ask people to consider what's appropriate and what isn't instead of just engaging without thinking, I think the more likely people are to understand the difference between when they're supposed to be nice and when they can use dickishness as a tool. Okay. Um, well, I certainly see the validity of the, uh, the argument on the advertising. Um, not everyone is capable or chooses the path of critical thinking. And uh, I, we've all heard the phrase, no means no. Um, with the Prop 8 thing, with a margin of 400 and some odd votes to lose by. Well, I we mean, lost by 500,000 votes. Oh, OK. It's just that those 500,000 came almost entirely from one ad. OK. Yeah. OK, I was just wondering how much of uh, the, <laughs> the no means yes and yes means no caused some There was uh, confusion equal confusion conflict. on each side, so it actually balanced out. Okay. So it was, it was almost exactly the same. All right. It, 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 everybody knew very well what was going on because so much advertising. I mean, there was $80 million spent on this proposition campaign. Very few people didn't know what it was. Okay. So. Thank you for your wonderful speech, Thank you. Ms. Miller, wonderful. Um, I wanted to make sure that you knew about the Anti-Discrimination Support Network's collection of discrimination narratives. And if you don't, I, I would love to share that information with you. By all means. And um, it's available on a website as well for other people who want to see narratives, um, stories about discrimination, mostly collected from the atheist community. But I also want to compliment you on promoting the idea of telling your story, um, whether it's a journey story or one particular incident that you could talk about how skepticism came into a conversation, how the conversation went, and you know whether there was any movement on either side. Right. So sharing those stories are so important, and thank you for bringing it up. Thank you very much. Um, my conversion story is I was eight, and I found all my teeth. My mom had kept them from the tooth fairy thing. And I, I just made the assumption, no tooth fairy, no Easter bunny, no Santa Claus, no Jesus. It just made sense. Um, and I don't think everybody would have made that logical leap, but I did. So, um, yeah, no, it's just. They were the same person for a long time in my mind. Yes, Liz. Hi, Ashley. I just wanted to say hi because I didn't realize you were here until just now, and I'm literally leaving in like two minutes. So I couldn't wait till after. Good to hi. see you. <laughs> That's an excellent question. Hi, uh, uh, I've always had a problem with I can do the logical side of it, but when I get to the ethical side, uh, my ethics are so very different from some of the people I'm arguing that I can't even begin to see where they're coming from because what they're usually saying to me I find horrifying. Um, how do you deal with that? Like I deal with people with like some of the preachers and the stuff they're saying to me is fundamentally wrong, and I don't know how to even connect to even approach other than just being a dick. But then they shut me down and don't even listen to me because they think that. I am so against them. How do you normally, how do you approach something like that? It's very difficult. Um, my father is a tea partier. <laughs> I'm sorry. My father <laughs> thinks that Sarah Palin <laughs> is awesome. <laughs> my father stopped talking to me for six months because I wrote about Gabby Giffords 
and mentioned that Sarah Palin had had a uh, thing with a target on it. And what I said about Sarah Palin was this. I feel sorry for Sarah Palin because of the amount of shit she's going to get over this because everybody does it. And it shouldn't happen, but it's not her fault that that's the way they advertised. My father stopped talking to me for six months because of that. What you do is you try to keep the dialogue open if you think that there's any possibility or if you can't escape them. I have to keep the dialogue open with my father because he's my dad. But, you know, if it's somebody who I don't really give a shit about, why make the effort, right? So that seems like an excellent opportunity to be a dick and be right to the other people watching the argument because you're not going to convince the person you're talking to unless you can find some sort of common ground. There's just no way. And the thing is, when you're talking to someone who's hyper-religious, the best you can do is plant seeds, usually. You're not going to change their mind right then. You can plant seeds. You can talk about humanism sometimes. You can talk about whether it's right to be mean to someone. You know, there you go. Whether it's right to take away rights. Whether it is correct to make people be bullied. Whether it's right to promote views that end up with people being killed. Just, you have, to, you have to just plant the seeds. I don't think you can really convince them, regardless of whether you're nice or mean. Thank you. Yeah. Um, first, just kind of a comment on your not alienating people that speak for the same reasons. Um, like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X had totally different views on how things should happen, but they both contributed really well to the civil rights movement. And they balanced each other out. You needed both. Yeah. Um, but uh, also I was wondering um, kind of uh, what do you think about um, some of the the ways that um, the like the skeptics movement or the atheist movement could stop being like the single individual in a community that you know is like the witch that eats babies when they come by you know and actually well, could turning it babies. into a into a community <laughs> But but turning it into into a community, um, like there there are a lot of ads that take you know like the the Mormonism ads that are going on the I'm a Mormon thing. Yeah, but the actually, Mormon church has they're, money. They're bringing a group together. Yeah. Um, that was kind of obscure, and atheists don't really have that at all. That's because we don't have money. That's because we're not making people tithe, because we're good people. Um, <laughs> So I, I think part of the problem is that uh, what you're talking about is, is organization. And atheists are cats, they're not dogs, you know, they are hard to corral. And another part of the problem is that you do have people who are by themselves, who are literally in a community by themselves, and that's hard, that's really hard to do. But what we have is an amazing internet community. We have really this great ability to be one group online. And I think we are making a better effort to make more public campaigns. We've got the billboards, we've got the SCA, we've got Sean Faircloth just rocking shit out. You know, we've got we've got a lot of different places that we're working on it. The problem is funding. I mean, it's expensive to get media, and the only way you can do it if you don't have money is by being interesting. And that's difficult to do in a way that sells the idea that we're just really nice people next door. But we've got billboards, and I can't remember who's put them up. We've got billboards. It's just normal people who are like, freedom it's Freedom From Religion Foundation. And it's billboards with just a normal person who lives in the community, and it says, you know, I'm a great father and a humanist, and I don't need God. And so it's about how normal people are nice people, and they just don't believe in God, and that's okay. So. Hello. Um, I started a group that I can hear a lot of people going, oh. Um, two things. I started a group called Queer and Atheist, and it's for queer atheist. folks who are atheists. And uh, one of the things is that on, on one end from atheists, I get the, well, why do you need a separate group? And this also happens with people of color who start a, a group of atheism. And, and people are not understanding that people needs are different within the community. And I actually think one of the ways in which that is different 
and you did cover it so well, is the emotional component that is involved when you have like multiple forms of oppression. There's that, com there's that emotional component that's involved and it's certainly involved when you talk about black folk and uh, atheism. It is, it is like all emotion. And then sometimes when you talk about queerness and atheism, and I use queer in a positive way because I identify as queer. Um, then, you know, it's very emotional, and I like that. Uh, but one of the things, and that I find keeps people away from, keeps atheists and, and queer folks and people of color apart from each other when there certainly are, there's a connection. But I think one of the ways in which this could happen, in which uh, atheists can, can get more out there, is also concentrating on social justice issues. I agree, absolutely. So, Thank you. Sure. I, I think that that's absolutely correct, uh, particularly when reaching out to people of color. We really need to be focusing on their issues because there are a lot of issues that we can approach from a skeptical point of view. Uh, look at the prison rates in the United States. We have the highest prison rate in the world, and most of them are young black men. And we should care about that as skeptics, we should, we should want to know why that is and why it's wrong and what we could do to change it. We are not super activists right now. We do not go out and find causes and help other people. And I think that there's a lot of room for skeptics to do that. So thank you for your comment. So I read a lot of PZ Myers, Richard Dawkins, um, Christopher Hitchens, and I love reading it. It feels great. Uh, but sometimes I worry that it feels so good, it can't be good for us. Uh, and so... As Are you Christian? Did you come from a background of sin? <laughs> it feels good, therefore it's bad. Are you Catholic? <laughs> anyway, let me, uh, let, me, let me keep going. Um, on, a, on a more serious note, as, as a fully skeptical person, you know, bachelors of science in aerospace engineering. Um, do we have any, well, I guess it's social scientific evidence, so we'll take what we can get, but do we have anything that's not anecdotal, like some serious statistical data that suggests that being a dick is in fact effective? It's very difficult to measure. Um, there, have, there have been some studies, you know? It is very difficult to measure. There's just no scale. Okay. <laughs> I mean, because all of those authors have a, have a lot of anecdotal evidence. Um, they, they all have anecdotal, I mean, they all have anecdotal evidence. I know five people who say Christopher Hitchens is why I'm an atheist. Christopher Hitchens is why I am out. That's why I d identify as an atheist. I didn't believe in God, but it didn't seem important to me to mention it. And then I listened to God is not great, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> all right. And so I think they're better at getting people out of the closet than converting people. But I do know people who are converts. And again, it's all anecdotal. It really is. Because it's very difficult to measure, and it's subjective. And people don't even know their own minds sometimes. So how do you measure that? And social science, which is what I'm doing right now, I'm getting my PhD in mass communications, so much of it is just guesswork or trying to make statistics make sense. And it's not necessarily as rigid or as understandable as, you know, what you would probably call real science. Um, that, I, w I was just kidding. I didn't really mean I know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's, there's, no, there's very little, there are very few studies that have been done on it. A lot of them point to being nice as a good thing to do, but not very conclusively. And under certain circumstances, it's very difficult to say, oh, in this circumstance this, in this circumstance that. How do you measure all of that? It's an it's, it's underexplored scientific question. Good luck with the PhD. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you have 42 seconds. I'll try to be quick. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, um, being an atheist, I was uh, always looking for a community. And I actually went to a few churches because I wanted that community and none of them fit, and I found the Unitarian Church. And uh, I don't know if every, anybody even here is aware of the fact that the Unitarian Church is actually a wonderful place for gays, lesbians, uh, agnostics, atheists to get together. Wiccans, um, Buddhists. Exactly. 
and um, very accepting uh, place. It's a I never would have found a group of atheists had I not found the Unitarian Church, just to spread that love. So, The minister at my UU church in Columbia is an atheist, which is fantastic yeah. and very confusing. Two churches. <laughs> very confusing. Very confusing. Uh, Unitarian churches often do programs. They often do programs of social justice. They do social justice programs. They are very big on gay rights, for example. And they help homeless people, and they do great stuff. The atheist group in Columbia, South Carolina, which is where I'm getting my degree, meets in the UU at times. So, yeah, so it's it's a great resource for people who are looking for a community in a place where there's not one for atheists. It was not necessary for me when I lived in Los Angeles, for example, because there was a huge skeptic community. Um, so that's everything I've got, and thank you very much.